Well, hello, I'm Box Flyer, and this is part one of a two-part series on servicing the brakes on an R1200 RT. This is a K52 model. I'm going to start with the front half of the brakes. The rear half is in a separate video. What we're going to do here, you have to keep the concept of the process in mind that we take things apart to clean and inspect components for the right size and wear. Then we lubricate to make sure that everything moves freely, is gonna work functionally correct from here forward. And then we're gonna finally replace the fluid, have all new fluid in the system. And the process in which you do this, in the order you do it, allows you to keep the fluid from being contaminated or only replace the fluid in the hoses. One of the first things I'm going to do in anticipation of pushing the pistons back into the calipers is I need to remove some fluid from the reservoir. I'm going to lower the bike down from the lift, remove the cover from the reservoir, extract some of the fluid out of there. And so I need to protect the body panels from getting into the brake fluid on them. In order to remove some of the fluid from the reservoir, these are T20 size screws go in here. You want to protect the body panels from having any fluid that could possibly drip out of the reservoir and damage the paint film on the bike. So here comes a drip coming off of here right now. I've got this towel down here to catch the fluid, the excess fluid that's in here. Once all the screws are loose from the cap on the reservoir, we pull off the cover, examine the fluid in the reservoir, and see if there's any contamination or accumulation of condensation, water, that gets into the area that the brake fluid is hygroscopic, so it absorbs moisture to a point, and then it starts to separate, and you actually see water in there. We'll clean off the sealing surface of this air bladder. This keeps as much air surface away from the brake fluid as possible. And now I'll extract as much fluid out of there as I can because the next process is going to be to push the pistons out just slightly. So I want to leave a little reservoir fluid in here. I want to push the pistons out just slightly so that I can clean all the area of the pistons then when I push the pistons into the calipers themselves, they will displace quite a bit of fluid, so I don't want this to overflow. I need to move some of it out, then when we push the pistons back, it will fill this back up. To extract the fluid out of the reservoir, you get your receptacle to catch the fluid real close to this edge, so you're not dragging a dripping hose over the body panels. Right here, I've got the bottle, to, the little jar to catch my brake fluid. I'm just going to suck some out. Now I've removed about half of the quantity of the reservoir. And that's okay. That's, that'll be enough to allow the pistons in the calipers to displace that fluid. When we finally get the pistons and the calipers all the way pushed back in, we'll extract all of this fluid and start with fresh fluid in the reservoir. As part of the process of taking the caliper off and moving the pistons in and out, you use the handbrake lever to pump the pistons out to get a new surface area to clean around the pistons on the caliper. I have an old style caliper here that you can split the halves. With this K52, the wet head and shift head series, it's a one piece caliper. There are no splits in this caliper. All of the pistons are installed from the space that's provided. With this old style, you can split the body of the caliper. Here I'm gonna show you how to extend a piston all the way. I'm gonna use a little air pressure in here to extend a piston. And I'll show you if a piston does get extended too far when you're pumping them out to try and clean it, how you can put it back in, what the components are inside the caliper itself. Here I have an air chuck with a nozzle on it. I'm just going to put my hand over this, the pistons themselves. Introduce a little bit of air pressure into here. 
and see if I can uh, get the pistons to come out. Here, one of the pistons just popped right out. If you pump the, the pistons too much and it comes out of the body of the caliper, this is exactly what you end up with. This is going to be loose in between the two halves of the caliper, since this is a one-piece caliper. Now you need to negotiate and get this thing back in. While this piston is out, I want to show you the seals on the inside that we're trying to clean the edges of the piston to prevent us from introducing the dirt and crap that's on the side of the piston into the bore of the caliper. The first thing that's in here is a wiper seal, and this wiper is what scrapes off the dirt and crud from the sides of the piston. And the other seal is the one that holds the brake fluid pressure when you're applying brakes. And this is a square cut seal. Both of these are precision seals. They're not just off the shelf seals. To put it back together, I'm just gonna put it in the groove that it fits in. There are the two grooves. It can only go in the correct groove. This big square cut seal can only go in the one designed for it. Put it back together. Then I'll show you how to put the piston back in its bore. It's seated in its bore. Then the one that's the wiper seal goes in to the, the groove that's a little closer to the edge. I'm going to put a little bit of brake caliper assembly lube, this brake caliper lubricant, on the edge of this piston to facilitate this going together. That's what this fluid is designed for, is brake caliper assembly. I'm just lubricating the entry seal of this. If this did pop out of your caliper, you just need to clean it up get it square in the bore, and it slides right in. It's back in place. This is not a really tragic event. If the piston pops out, it'll fit right back in. The service schedule that BMW publishes talks about checking front brake pads and brake discs for wear. There is no interval on it. This is a 6,000 mile service. I profess that you need to do this every time you do an oil change. You need to check the, clear, the pads for cleanliness, and clean the holes. These are called lightning holes. They lighten the rotor. You need to clean out the holes in the rotors. You need to clean the grooves on the pads. It says to change the brake fluid initially after the first year and then every two years thereafter. The fluid replacement is another critical part of the job that needs to be done as well. I'm going to start taking this apart. Uh, there's a safety clip that holds a cross pin in here, this spring clip. This is a T30 that holds the cross pin in. There's a spring, the anti-rattle spring is pushing against it constantly. It helps if you push the spring back when you are turning this cross pin out, the pin that holds the pads in place. Once it's out, now we can reduce the pressure on this anti-rattle spring. It comes right out. and The pads themselves will slide right out of, out of their positions. Maintain the orientation of these for a second while we're bringing them out. And I'm gonna just, before I do anything with them, I'm going to set them down right here for a second, get a Sharpie. This is on the right-hand side, the outer pad. I do right, outer, flip it over. This one is the right inner. Now the orientation of the pads will go back in against the rotor face the way that they came out. As I open them up and take a look, the grooves that are in here are the legal limit for wear. These things also get completely clogged up with road debris. If you ride in the rain at all, the sand and crud from the road gets built up in these grooves. If the grooves are full, 
they are like lapping compound and wear on the face of the rotor. If the rotor lightning holes get filled full of the debris from the road film as well, they are lapping compound on the face of the pads. Both of them wear each other out excessively. That's why the maintenance interval that I state, you ought to do every 6,000 miles, you ought to clean out the holes at, and the grooves in the pads. Here's a, an example of some older pads that have been on bikes and uh, this one is worn down excessively. One side is worn down to where it's almost at the wear limit of the wear groove and the other side is still showing a lot of depth in the groove. This is irregular wear that's beside from side to side on the front brakes. It's not acceptable. You just got to find the problem. Why did one side wear it's doing all the braking or it's dragging and the other side's not doing the braking or it's actually working correctly? There's something wrong that you have to investigate and you have to look at the evidence to determine what's going on. One of the other things we look for is the thickness of the rotor itself. The rotor here on this one, right stamped on the surface of the rotor, it says men thickness 4.0 millimeters. I'm going to measure the thickness of the rotor in several locations at several, whether it's the inside or the outside of the rotor. This one says it's 4.548. That is a good amount, and I'm going to go out here closer to the middle. 4.537, and measure on the outer radius, the outer circumference of the brake pad, and it says 4.549, and I need to measure in another place around the brake disc, 4.549, and further in, 4.540. The thickness of the rotor is okay. It doesn't show excessive wear, and that's typical for the 12,000 mile service. I'm going to remove the caliper itself. Start looking for any indications that anything else has interfered with the operation of these brakes. The pads don't show me that there's anything really wrong underneath here. A visual inspection is required to see if tar or a stone has built itself up, gotten in here, and is impeding the free motion of the brakes. Remember that on the front brakes of these bikes, they have a fixed caliper and a floating rotor. Once the caliper is removed, and here's another thing you need to kind of keep an eye on. If you have the brake, the weights are here, the brake may not clear the inside of the rim. Likewise, the inflation valve will stop you from getting the caliper off. Just try and position your tire so that there is clearance behind here. Now that we've got the caliper off of the front fork, it's time to do some visual inspections to see if we've got anything causing... Uh, hang-ups, like if there's a stone or some tar or mud or anything that's causing this to bind up and not function properly. They all look like they're extended about the same. There's a little bit of film I can feel on the sides of the pistons. What I want to do now is I reach up. I left some brake fluid in the reservoir. So I'm going to pump the handbrake a little bit to get these pistons to come out. I want them to come out about the thickness of the shoelace that I'm going to do use to clean these. I can see the fluid is still in the reservoir in the sight window as I pump this out. So I get these pumped out just a little bit. I only need it to be out about the width of my shoelace. That's all I'm really going to be cleaning. It really helps to have somebody else's hand here. I want my assistant here to hold the caliper while I put the shoelace around one of the pistons, just get it to where it's all around the whole circumference of the brake piston and you just shine this like you're shining the ends of shoes. Move on to the next one. 
I'm going to go to the other side to get the back side surface. These are nice and shiny now. This surface area is all shiny around here, nice and clean. And I want to put on some of this brake caliper assembly lube all the way around the pistons, on the edges of the pistons. Just a really light little layer, a coat, and I'm going to use a Q-tip to spread it around. So that I do some on the top and the bottom, all four of them at the same time. Because we're going to be pushing them in simultaneously, all four of them at the same in time, in and out, working them around all simultaneously. Now I get a Q-tip and just work this around every area because as this moves in, it'll distribute this lubricant to every part of the caliper seal in there. Once that's all in place, I'm just going to start pushing the pistons in, work them, each one of them individually so that they get pushed back into the caliper bodies and that lubricant gets on those seals. Pretty soon it just starts working very, very easily. As they get buried into the body of the caliper, they're, they're moving freely. The seals now have new lubricant on them. So I'm gonna push them out a little bit more, pump the handle up here at the handbrake, push them out if one of them comes out a little bit too fast, Hold it in with your finger to get the other pistons to extend some. And then push them in again, push them in, get all new, get lubricant on all those seals. Here you can see that one pops out when the other one goes in. That's really a good sign that these are all well lubricated, moving freely. The only thing that causes the pads to retract when the brakes are rotating, when the tire's turning around, is the irregularity of the rotor itself. It's the only thing that pushes these back. And if it is too difficult to move, then it hangs up. The brake pads rub on the rotors, causes excessive heat buildup and wear. Once you push them all the way back in, they're completely buried flush into the body of the caliper. Wipe off all the excess around all of the areas that you added the, that lubricant in the first place. You keep the pistons completely buried into the caliper. At this point, now we're gonna be able to remove all of the fluid from the reservoir. The other side has already been done. I have the pads installed, wedges are installed to keep the pistons completely buried in the caliper on the other side. Clean up all the excess lubricant off of the calipers and the pistons inside and out. It's ready to start being reinstalled. Everything gets put back together. Hang this on the fork. Put the bolts back in. Leave the pads out until the very end. We have to lubricate them. The contact points for where everything goes back together. Now I'm going to torque the bolts that hold the caliper to the fork leg. That's something that this is available on the description below. You can download the torque sheet for both a 1200 or a 1250. The torques are slightly different for a 1250. As we see here on the brake caliper on the front fork is 38 Newton meters. It tells you to use a 13 millimeter tool to, to install this on the bike. 38 Newton meters. Now I need to have everything cleaned up. It's time to clean all the pins, all the clips, all the edges of the brake pads so that when I start assembling things, everything is lubricated to go, to, to go together all at once. There's times where you are putting one piece together and you realize that the next piece you're gonna to touch is still dirty. It's, so just clean up everything. 
Then start lubricating it so that you can assemble everything together all at once. I like to clean the edges of the brake pads as well so that this area doesn't cause any abrasion on the rotor. I use Silveramic on all the contact points, steel on steel or anything else in the braking system. This is good up to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. So I just put a little bit on a Q-tip. This is the right inner, and this is the right outer. The brakes are going to be forced to go that way. This is the thrust bearing end, the surface that it bears all of the thrust of the braking effort. So it's the most important one to get some lubricant on it. Real light film. Don't get it close to the braking surface of the brake pads. The other side is where it rests on the bottom and just sits in, on the caliper body when it's not in use. There's contact on the pin and then on the bottom side where the anti-rattle spring goes. The anti-rattle spring. When this goes in, you need to pay attention. There's a small arrow engraved in the edge of the face of this spring. It could be installed upside down. It will fit physically. It'll push against the edge, the little ear on the brake pads, but this arrow indicates rotation of the rotor. So you want to line it up so that it follows the rotation of the rotor. This is where the pin rides on that. The two ears of the anti-rattle spring touch the brake pads right there. The last part that's going to go together is going to be the cross slide pin. I just put some lubricant across the whole surface of that. You don't know how this is going to line up when you tighten it down into the body of the caliper. Everything is lubed up and ready to be assembled all at once. I've got the right outer. This obviously goes together. We just slide it between the pistons on the caliper and the face of the rotor. It sits still there. And then I put the right inner in. It lines up, also sits on its shelf. I need to get the anti-rattle spring. The bottom corner of it goes inside the middle of the caliper itself. I put the pin in to engage the first, the outside pad first, because when I push this spring in, it's going to make the pad slide away. So now I've got it, the cross pin through the spring, and the other pad is engaged, and I have to push the bottom side of the pad from inside to get it to line up with the hole on the other side of the caliper body itself. This is called the grub screw. The grub screw holding the pads on the front, the six Newton meters. That's a very low value. I've got um, a low range torque wrench that I use for all of the engine low torques. Anything below 15 Newton meters, I use this torque wrench, six Newton meters. It's just a very low value. You can't use a normal torque wrench. And there are 6.35 Newton meters of force to tighten that up. The last thing that needs to be installed is the spring clip that goes around the little groove that's in here. Make sure you take this out when you're gonna remove the grub screw. If you forget to take this spring off of here, if it's buried and out of view, you don't re recall that it's there, and you start backing this out, and damage that sleeve, the small little annular groove that's on the inside there, this little groove right here where that spring goes in there. If you pull, if you back this out, force that spring against these grooves, you ruin this pin. The full kit, you can't buy this pin separately, you can't buy the spring. The anti-rattle spring, the retaining spring, and the grub screw 
are about $38 for a whole set. You can only buy them as a set. So just remember to take this spring out before you try and remove this. Now that the pads are fully retracted, I'm gonna use these shims to wedge between the rotor and the pads to hold the pads out. I wanna make sure that I can see the pads, these little shims coming between the rotor and the pad. I've done it to the other side already, and I wanna put this in the inside vert of the pads as well to keep the pistons from advancing. I've got a shim wedged between the rotor and the pad face on both sides, on the left-hand caliper over there and on the right-hand caliper over here. Now, the last thing I need to do is replace the bleeder with a speed bleeder. Got a speed bleeder. The part numbers for all the speed bleeders on this bike will be listed below in the description. I add a little bit of extra PTFE paste thread sealant to augment the sealant that comes with the speed bleeder. Yeah, and so another thing to point out is every one of the brake calipers takes a different part number. They have different threads. They're different sizes. So these are stainless steel speed, speed bleeders. They make a standard steel, a regular steel version, and a stainless steel version. I think the stainless steel version is the way to go. They don't corrode and they last longer uh, in the environment where the brakes are exposed to the elements. I'm going to get a rag here ready to get this one is ready to be installed as quickly as I can get this one off and get the new one installed. There'll be brake fluid running out of here the whole time. Get everything staged beforehand. Put in the new speed bleeder. One of the points that you need to be cautious of with a lot of brake systems is that it's advisable to bleed the brake from the reservoir to the farthest brake first. With this case of the BMW, the brake reservoir goes through the pipe, through the ABS module, comes down and it splits right in the middle of the front fork. The length of the hose going to either side is the same. There is no preferential side to bleed first. Now I'm gonna start the bleeding process. I'm gonna first hang this bag, get everything ready to bleed from down at the lower part of the bike. Then I'm gonna lower the bike on the lift and extract all the fluid from the reservoir, put in new fluid, and start the bleeding process. I'm gonna hang a small bungee. I like to have the hose uphill. I'm going to put this on here. Right now I'm just going to leave it closed. The fluid will move up the hose and down to the bag. I'm going to lower the bike and get to the main reservoir again and extract all of the fluid out of the reservoir. Now I've lowered the bike, I need to completely evacuate all of the fluid out of the reservoir and we're going to start with new, clean, fresh fluid. The reason that I kept some in here was I needed to pump out the pistons in the calipers I need to just get rid of all of this fluid because we're going to put in completely new fluid for the reservoir and pump fluid through all of the lines. Once you've sucked out all the fluid you can with some kind of a baster or a syringe, Use a clean paper towel, wipe out the rest of the reservoir bottom, get all of the debris out of there. If there's any little white bits of moisture contamination, you just wanna start with as much clean fluid in here as possible. Right now, the whole bottom of the reservoir is completely empty. There's nothing in there. I don't wanna to touch the lever and push any air into the system at all. 
And remember that the new spec for all the brake fluid is dot four LV, low viscosity. All the brake pads, the pistons are pushed all the way into the caliper bodies. The first pumping that I do is gonna pump fluid through the brake lines, through the ABS module, through the lines. It can be above the full mark. I'm gonna to have to fill this several times, so I'm not really concerned about the initial level of what I have here. I've got the bag hooked up, the wrench is on the speed leader, and it doesn't matter whether you do the right side or the left side first. I'm just gonna crack open the valve, and start to pump the handbrake, and watch the color of the fluid coming up the hose. The hose is now got a lot of old yellow colored fluid in it coming out. And I'm watching the level of fluid in the reservoir that it doesn't get down to the port. So I don't suck any air into the reservoir. Like I said, this has to go from the reservoir through the lines all the way to the ABS module, out of the ABS module, up to the split, the Y point at the fork. Then it goes down to each caliper body individually. I'm still not even down to the window, the sight window in the reservoir yet. And I'm pumping and watching the color of the fluid as it comes all the way through the system. The first one that you do, you're pumping fluid through the full length of the uh, brake lines. The next side you do, you only are going to get fluid from the split at the top of the fork to the caliper body itself. Well, now this is coming through clear. This is like the new fluid that I just put in. This side is done. I just tighten it up, quarter turn. I'm done bleeding all of the lines in the system. I haven't used the GS911 module to cycle the ABS itself. There is a module in the GS911 software. I think it really is only necessary when you replace a component of the ABS system itself. The activation of the anti-skid chambers in the ABS module is, I don't know how it all works, and I don't really care. I think it bleeds the fluid through under normal operation. You get fresh fluid into the ABS modules. Unless you've, you need to purge the air out of the ABS module, I don't think it's necessary. I think you can do a conventional bleeding of the reservoir and the calipers and all the lines you will have sufficiently replaced all of the fluid. Now that I've already bled this side, the right hand side caliper is completely bled, the fluid has all gone through the system, I need to top this off. I'm going to bleed the left hand front caliper. So I've just topped off this reservoir with new DOT4 fluid. We'll just go over to the left hand side. I've hung the speed bleeder bag so that the initial direction that the hose goes is uphill. I crack the bleeder a quarter of a turn, and all I have to do is start pumping the brake as a one-man bleeder. I see the initial movement of the fluid is a little bit yellow to start with. Very quickly, it turns to clear. It's already becoming clear fluid at the hose, down here it's already becoming clear. I'm going to tighten this up. The only part of the brake system that I had to evacuate new was from this split down to this caliper. And I've just replaced all the fluid and all the hoses in all of the brake system. Now once this is, the brake lines are all new fluid in them, I'm going to remove the wedges all of the wedges come out of both sides. Pull out the wedges on this side, and now I'm going to pull out the wedges on this side. The pistons are now free to move forward. All of the fluid that was new fluid in the lines will now fill the area in the calipers behind the pistons. We'll have completely new fluid in the most critical place, which is behind the pistons. If you just bleed, the lines without going through the, all this trouble of cleaning the pistons and pushing the pistons back into the body, wedging them into the body, 
you get new fluid down here. If you only bleed the lines to the bleed nipple, it comes out, bleeds into the bag, and you don't get any new fluid in the caliper bodies. And that's the point of this whole thing, is to get new fluid in the caliper bodies. Now when I start to pump the brakes out, I get the pistons are starting to advance. Move the pads up to the face of the rotors. You can see them advance. The area behind the pistons is all new fluid. And this will get a firm handle up here pretty quick as it fills all of the four chambers on each side have to be filled with new fluid. I'm watching the reservoir so that it doesn't become uncovered. It takes quite a bit of fluid to fill that void behind the calipers. Now I've finally got an absolutely rock hard handle on this hand grip. The reservoir level is down in the sight window, down to the minimum line. The level that I want to put the reservoir to is not full, not to the maximum line, because the brakes are not new. If I was putting in brand new brake pads, I'd fill it up to the high level, the highest line. But since the brakes are probably one quarter used, I only I want to have the fluid down one quarter of the level. There it is. Now I've got a full bubble visible in the window. That's all I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave all that space in the reservoir. We've cleaned off the cover previously and the gasket. We can put it back on put the screws in, tighten them down. Now that the top side is all serviced, I'm gonna come back down here and wipe up, make sure that there are no drips, put the dust caps back on, the brake bleeders. We can see that uh, the Outside of the calipers are all cleaned up from this, the lubricant that we put on there. You cleaned out the holes, the lightning holes. Use a drill and a brush to clean those out. Clean out the holes with a drill and a brush. We've already cleaned the pads when we put them in. This brake job is good for another 6,000 miles until it's time to inspect and clean the brake surfaces and the rotors again. As a recap to what we did, the concept of cleaning the brakes, lubricating the brakes, and then replacing all the brake fluid is the three-step process that I adhere to for a complete box flyer brake job. If you skip any of the steps by pushing the pistons back in, the dirty pistons in, it makes it worse for the rest of the life of the bike. If you do this more frequently, like at a 6,000 mile interval, You'll extend the life of the pads, the rotors, and you'll have a safer braking event all the time. The references for the maintenance schedule that define what brake pad inspection and discs for wear is very in-depth. You can't just read over this and make a cursory look at the brakes. You've got to do a lot of inspection. Following the brake flush intervals is really, really important making sure that you follow the torque settings recommended for your bike. Each bike is different, so make sure you look up your specific bike for your torque settings. Keep your bike running in top shape by following the directions in the book, following the box flyer guidance. As a final recap, whenever you do a job like this, you have to ask yourself to do the QA, the quality assurance. In this case, we know we've tightened this, we've installed the spring pin correctly, these have been torqued properly, we've tightened the bleeder screws, we've put on the dust cap, uh, we know that we did the other side, we tightened the main bolts and the QA on both sides is fine. It's important to do your own quality assurance. The brakes are one of the most important components on the bike and you don't want this to go off out of your shop or out of your own garage for your own riding without everything being completely safe. Just do yourself a favor, keep your distractions to a minimum, do the work and then review your work and verify that you've done everything properly. I'm Boxflyer and I appreciate your support. If you like this video, 
hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.